Don Patterson uh, was born in Dundee uh, in 1963, and his first collection, Nil Nil, was published in 1993 and won the Forward Prize for the best first collection. Uh, and since that time, he uh, has gone forward and not looked back, so to speak. Uh, subsequent collections, including God's Gift to Women, Landing Light, both recipients of the T.S. Eliot Prize. His most recent collection is Rain, and his selected poems was published in 2012. Uh, he's written drama for the radio and stage, has been poetry editor for Picador uh, since 1997, and he's professor of poetry at the University of St. Andrews, fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, fellow of the English Association, and he was awarded an OBE in 2008 and the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry in 2010. Uh, he's also an accomplished jazz musician, but alas, seems not to have brought an instrument with him um, to the, uh, the, the, this evening. David Harsant is Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Roehampton, um, uh, Chairman of a rival poetry institute to ours, feel free to boo. Um, he's published nine volumes of poetry and Legion uh, won the Forward Prize for Best Collection 2008. <coughs> Knight was shortlisted, triple shortlisted, shortlisted for three UK prizes and won the Griffin International Poetry Prize. Uh, he's collaborated with con composers, notably Harrison Bur um, Burt Whistle, and th these commissions have been performed at the Royal Opera House, uh, in the proms at the Royal Albert Hall, the Concert Kabouv, uh, the Wales Millennium Centre, uh, in Athens at the Megaron, the South Bank Centre, the Alderborough Festival, and uh, other places. Uh, wonderfully, um, disturbingly, sinisterly entitled uh, collection, Sprinting from the Graveyard, English versions of poems written under siege in Sarajevo, by the Bosnian poet Goran Simic um, have been widely acclaimed and were incorporated by Nigel Osborne into his opera, Sarajevo. Um, and most recently, volume of poems by Yanis Ritsos in Secret, published by Annie Thalman Press in November 2012. Sean O'Brien is professor of creative writing at Newcastle University and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. He's a poet, critic, broadcaster, novelist, and playwright. I was, when I read those wonderful lists, I think of a, a lovely line from Browning, many-handed as a cuttlefish. Um, he grew up in Hull and lives in Newcastle, and he's won many awards for his poetry, including again the T.S. Eliot Prize, three forward prizes. His eighth collection, November, was shortlisted for four major awards, trumping the triple shortlisted David Harsant, <laughs> including the 2012 International Griffin Prize and his collected poems was published in 2012. Um, he wrote a verse version of Aristophanes' comedy, The Birds, which was staged at the Littleton Theatre in 2002. And Dante's Inferno, a verse translation, was published in 2006. Uh, he delivered the British Centre for Literary Translations 2012 W.G. Siebold Lecture on Making the Crossing, the Poet as Translator. Um, another string to that translating bow, his version of the Spanish Golden Age comedy uh, Don Gil of the Green Breeches by Tirso de Molina opens at the Ustinov Studio, in, uh, opened at the University uh, Ustinov Studio in September uh, 2013 before transferring to the Arcola, London, and the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry. Uh, he's done versions from the Portuguese of the poetry of Cosino Fortes, and these will be published in 2014. So we have um, a panel of immense distinction, expertise, um, and I also hope and, and know liveliness, um, and I'm very pleased to um, welcome them this evening. Uh, we're going to begin, however, with a short film clip um, from uh, Jean Cocteau's <coughs> film Le Testament d'Orphée. Uh, and in this clip we're going to see the character of Orpheus, the singer sitting in his car, 
translating poetry that's coming from an untraceable radio station, messages transmitted to him from the other world. Il n'y a pas la radio que dans les voitures. Je ne trouve ce poste nulle part ailleurs. Alors si je veux profiter de toi, il faudra vivre dans une voiture. Rien ne t'y oblige. Allez, Allez, écoute, mon amour. 38, 39, 40, deux fois. Je répète, 38, 39, 40, deux fois. Attention. Écoute. Je n'ai presque entendu que des phrases insignifiantes. On fut une hier sensationnelle. 39. Reposez-vous un peu. 40, Merci pour que les phrases recommencent déjà avec ton dos. Alors, Faye, tu ne peux pas passer ta vie dans une voiture qui parle. Ce n'est pas sérieux. Pas sérieux. Ma vie commençait à se faisander, à être au point, à puer la réussite et la mort. Ne comprends-tu pas que la moindre de ces phrases est plus étonnante que mes poèmes Je donnerai mon œuvre entière. Pour une seule de ces petites phrases, je traque l'inconnu. Orphée, notre enfant ne vivra pas de ces petites phrases. Voilà les femmes, Hurtebise. On découvre un monde, elle vous parle layette et impôts. J'admire Orphée. Moi, j'aurais entendu mille fois ces petites phrases sans y prêter la moindre attention. D'où peuvent-elles venir, Hurtebise Aucun autre poste ne les aimait. J'ai la certitude qu'elle ne s'adresse qu'à moi. Mon fée, il n'y a plus que cette voiture qui compte. Je mourrai sans que tu t'en aperçoives. Nous étions morts sans nous en apercevoir. Méfiez-vous des sirènes. C'est moi qui les charme. Votre voix est la plus belle. Attention. Contentez-vous de votre écoute. voix. Chut. Attention, écoute. 2294. En vérité, voilà qui est très poétique. C'est ce qui est poétique ou pas poétique Orphée est, bien sûr, un film magnifique que j'imagine que beaucoup d'entre vous avez vu avant. Mon bit préféré est uh, le passage d'Ertebise et Orphée à travers le monde intérieur, pinné contre une mur de bois, contre une mur de bois, contre le travail de bois, et des mystérieux de glace qui passent à travers les passages de bois underground, de ce qui se trouve à être the military academy at Saint-Cyr, in the ruins of which certain scenes were shot, including the ones where Orphée is interrogated by a committee of the underground uh, for his indifference to political engagement during the war. So it's a great film. If you haven't seen it, watch it. But um, the idea, it's, it, I mean, there is an element of comedy here that he is taking um, what sound like bingo numbers seriously over the phone. And it reminds me, since we're in Bristol, of listening to Radio Luxembourg uh, in the 60s and that man who used to sell stamps from Keensham um, offering, you know, a fortune's worth of stamps for only a two shilling investment from Keensham, you know. And that was obviously an act that needed translation as well. Um, I'm sympathetic myself to, to Orpheus's um, sense of things that there is something to be understood which is at the same time not to be understood. There is something that wants to come over from one, one kind of speech into another uh, but doesn't want to be interpreted, I suspect. So I think that what Orpheus is looking for is um, an entirely pure subjective transition from one state into another, um, which is devoutly to be wished, but hard to come by. Um, uh, okay. uh, um, well, Orpheus <coughs> figures quite large in my life, well, in the life of any poet, for obvious reasons. Um, but I've worked... Uh, six times now with Harrison Birtwistle, uh, um, who, for whom Orpheus is a recurring theme. I did a piece with him um, called The Corridor, which was performed at uh, Aldborough and then at QEH. And it's about the moment, it's a sort of frozen moment in Orphic legend when Orpheus turns and looks back, thereby condemning Eurydice to return to Hades. Um, 
And I had to find, just, uh, just as I've always had to find with uh, Harry's projected notions, um, a way of making this my own. And it seemed to me that when I was uh, thinking about Eurydice, just as when we did the minor tour, I thought a lot about Ariadne, uh, as opposed to thinking about Theseus or thinking about Orpheus, um, that what Orpheus required of her was that she die twice. Um, <clears throat> so that this allowed me to invest in Eurydice a certain kind of skepticism. Uh, so the business of transformation, the business of of uh, um, coming from one state to another state, from one life, if you like, to another life, um, became the sort of center of the piece. Um, we've been talking all day about translation um, and about that sort of transformation uh, that has to do with bringing a piece from one language to another while at the same time having to make the sacrifices uh, that are crucial to, to that transformation. Um, I said earlier, I, I made this mention of murdering darlings and I said, it's not a matter of murdering someone else's darlings as making those darlings your own. Yeah. Um, and uh, although it's, uh, as they say in the television business, a weak link, the <laughs> fact remains <coughs> that uh, that's what um, Orpheus makes me think of in terms of translation, this business of, of um, traveling from one life to another life, from one existence to another existence, and what has to be shed or given up in the process in order to achieve, as it were, the other life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like the other guys, I thought an awful lot about the figure of Orpheus, um, partly in just uh, making a version of the, the Rilke uh, poems, uh, De Senator and Orpheus. Um, uh, you know, in the way in which Orpheus operates as a kind of figure that mediates, you know, between this world and the next, by which Rilke, you know, really means uh, the temporal and the atemporal, uh, you know, the, the here and now and the uh, eternal. And I think, you know, it's in that figure of mediation that, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that we seek our kind of patron saint, you know, because, as, you know, as Charles uh, Simic said, um, poetry is in itself, the composition of poetry is in itself a translation from the silence. It's something we do anyway. Um, before we even get into the question of translation, it's already a translation from some kind of secret kind of mandala that we incarnate in a form of words. Um, uh, and this is, uh, an, uh, I find it fascinating that Orpheus has to position himself between one world and, in, and the next, you know, in the land of the dead and the land of the living, in order to accomplish this. Uh, and the way that he, he, he uh, bridges this, the way that he creates this conduit, is in singing uh, across the gap, because it's in singing itself, of course, that we can uh, unite these discrete quanta of, uh, 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 of perceived time. And, uh, and, and to, you know, to some very, very small extent, uh, um, uh, 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 offer some kind of stay against the passage of time and, and, and away death itself, which, uh, you know, I, be, I believe at a small level in our psyche that, that poetry actually accomplishes. Uh, and so I think he's a good model in terms of how we might approach uh, the, uh, uh, the translation. I was going to say a whole b other bunch of stuff about Orpheus that you don't want me to, but it's, um, he's a problematic figure. Um, especially in relationship to the muse, which is something that, that um, is an aspect of his character that uh, Rilke scrupulously does not interrogate. Um, uh, uh, he very much conceives of Eurydice as a kind of idealized dance, you know, the, uh, um, the yang to his yin. Uh, he is kind of action, she is dance, she, he is idea, she is dance. Um, <clears throat> and there are problems with that in the patriarchy. You know, you don't have to um, think about that too long. Uh, for example, you know, just like it introduces a, 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 a problematic aspect that we might circumvent through the action of, of, of translation, which is in a way poetry without inspiration, but, you know, which makes it a kind of ideal uh, uh, form, I think, because inspiration is problematic, especially when you introduce the idea of the muse figure. Because as David said, you know, uh, Orpheus obliged Eurydice to die twice. He was really quite content on the first occasion. You know, she was, so all this is in a poem called Seamus Heaney called The Underground, incidentally. 
um, Eurydice, or uh, you know, is pursued uh, uh, by a satyr by Pan and steps in a nest of vipers uh, and dies. And that really is the making of Orpheus, you know, and and the songs that he makes to to grieve over. Eurydice, uh, the gods themselves weep at their beauty. He's quite, quite pleased at this outcome, you know. And then she goes down into hell, uh, goes down into the underworld, and uh, and of course uh, Orpheus uh, seeks a return. Uh, he enters there by song itself. He lulls Cerberus to sleep by song, and he tries to bring her back out. But I suspect uh, David and I agree that his looking back was entirely deliberate. He just didn't want a girlfriend because he would no longer be able to grieve her. So, uh, so I, I think there are, are kind of intrinsic problems uh, 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 with the whole myth. And um, translation, on the other hand, has always struck me as a kind of absolutely pure exercise, and it involves that, none of that guilt, none of that collateral damage, um, where you might kind of construct your life in a way that might get you another good poem, you know? Um, I think translation is, uh, is a way of doing that uh, 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 without doing that kind of damage. Uh, it's, uh, it's a way of bringing new poetry into the language without fucking your own life up recreationally. That's what I really meant to say. I didn't, I didn't quite have it that way. That, that he, I, You know, Gluck has it that, that she sort of nags him into looking back. It's an interesting way in, in, in Gluck's opera... What would happen if it had been Orpheus who died? You know, would Eurydice have um, had all this coming and going, or would she just have cracked on, you know, well, been a great poet? <laughs> she'd, have, she'd have organised a really good wake. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, in, in Gluck, she, uh, Gluck's notion is that she, she nags him into looking back. She's saying... You know, why won't you look at me? What, what's wrong with me? I mean, for heaven's sake, you've come all the way down to Hades and you've charmed Persephone and, and, and uh, who was, who's the um, god of the underworld? Help. Hades. Hmm? Hades. No. God. Uh, well, anyway, come to me in a second. But you've charmed these gods into, into allowing you to take me out of, of Hades. Why won't you? Look? My, my notion was that <clears throat> um, he was so impatient to, as it were, have her again, to possess her again, to, to have things back the way they were, that he did this business of, you know, if you're walking down the street and you're talking to someone and you're not looking at them and they stop to look in a shop window and you go on talking and then you suddenly realize that that person isn't there and you go, and it's, and it's instinctive and that's what he did um, in, 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 in my sort of version of the piece, um, that it was involuntary. Um, but sort of selfish in a kind of way. I think the whole thing has, has to do with selfishness on his part. And of course there was this, this thing about Simon, it wasn't just that he charmed the gods. Um, you know, when he sang, um, trees moved to follow him and stones from the ground. Yeah, animals you know, crawled out of the animals, way, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, and even after the men had tore him to pieces, his head floated down the sticks and, and went on singing, um, you know. But Rilke's conception, it, it dissolves up, into the air. It earth. washed up on, the north, on a bay on the north side of Lesbos, the island right. of yeah. Sappho, which is an interesting development. But the thing with Orphe, as portrayed by Jean Marais <coughs> in the film, is that Orphe is an idealist, you know, which entails a kind of selfishness. He said, how typical of a woman to be preoccupied with the triviality of children. Um, but... Poetry and translation in particular seem to me to be extremely practical activities. You know, they are not airy notions. You, you actually put one word next to the next one. But in what way do they differ? I mean, do you think, do you think translation takes place in the absence of inspiration? No, not necessarily. I think that... Um, I think that... Uh, I think that if a poem excites you, a poem in another language excites you, it may be some area of the poem which is not necessarily to the forefront of the poem in its original language. I mean, when I've worked on the poems of Corsino Fortes, who is a Cap Verdean poet who writes in Portuguese Creole, um, a great the kind of whole image base of his work is quite alien to me, you know, and to most white Europeans, I would think. So the excitement of it. <coughs> 
is a kind of rhythmic gestural life, and that's what you pursue. You know? But you have to do it in a practical sense. It's um, there's, there used to be an adver to illustrate this. I use a very vulgar example, if you bear with me for a moment, which is. There used to be an advertisement on the television many years ago, 20 years ago, and I can't remember what they were advertising, but in the advertisement, a hapless customer sits down in the chair of a sinister, very ugly barber with a crazed, ferocious stare and a haircut so appalling and lumpy and damaged it looks as if he's contracted mange. The barber tells the customer that he can have the same haircut as him, a Lionel Blair. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, Lionel Blair, now in his 80s, was a famous dancer and variety artist, dapper and always beautifully groomed. The customer protests that Lionel Blair doesn't have a haircut like the barber's. At this, the barber brandishes the clippers and says, he does when he comes in here. <laughs> that, was, that was a bit Delphic. What did you, what did you, what did you, what did you mean by that? <coughs> I mean that you can only translate, you know, that you can't pretend to be somebody else. There's no point in translating Rilke into English and sort of giving off that you're in some sense a kind of, you know, a gaseous product of Rilke. Yeah, but there is, there is a <laughs> gaseous product. <laughs> but, but there is a, look, I don't, I don't entirely agree with that. I, I, That's all right, we're supposed to be having a debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. When, when, <laughs> Well, let's try not to keep agreeing with each other. That would be good. Um, um, I, I said earlier, in the, in the, I gave a paper earlier, in the, and, and uh, I said one of the factors in translation for me was that, as with you know, original composition, when you're writing a poem, in other words, there's a sense in which one thing leads to another. And the challenge, one of the challenges in translation is, is to not forget that, in other words, not to disallow that, so that when you get, when you're remaking the poem, and that's, uh, in, in my terms, it, you know, when I'm working on a version, when I'm versioning something, that, that, that's the deal. I'm remaking it. I'm rewriting it, you know. And just as, you know, all writing is about rewriting, so all translating, in a sense, is about rewriting. It's not just about a word choice, an image cluster, it's actually rewriting um, in order to find in order to find the poem that you're looking for, which is going to be a poem in English, that better represents mm -hmm. the poet to an English audience than a strict translation would, um, then you do have to actually go along with the one thing leads to another stuff. In other words, you know, the compositional pressure that you're under when you're writing a poem, which has to do with sort of, as it were, following your nose. I mean, there are other, other things going on, of course. There are other things going on like craft and so on and so forth. But, you know, the business of following your nose in original composition actually applies to the business of versioning. Um, you can't ignore, you can't say, you know, I won't use this phrase, it's perfect for the poem I'm discovering. My, my, my paper was called Finding the Poem, so it's, it's perfect for the poem I'm finding, you know, but I can't use it because it wasn't used by the, by the poet. I mean, I think that's wrong, that's a wrong choice. You know, so, so I think that there isn't, it's not, it's not quite the practical thing, I think, that you're suggesting. I think it has to do more with the kind of compositional instinct that I find at work if I'm lucky. Well, I take that to be practicality. You know, that oh, well, you I work, can't. What you can I work, say? <laughs> you work with what arises in the imagination. You know, you but then that practicality would apply to, to original composition too. Yeah, but it's unusually, but it's unusually circumscribed. And as much as with original composition, what you have, you're, the, the, the one variable, the necessary latitude that you have, is you can recompose the content. I mean, it's just like you know, because I suspect we're all the same in this regard. And as much as you know, people have an idea about poets, they have an idea for a poem, they sit down, they write the poem. It's never that way for me. I suspect it's not that way for you guys. Yeah. You have a hunch. You're somebody, you're somebody you want to assuage. You know, a generative proposition you wish to pursue. You know, and the form of the poem itself is the resistance, and it's against that resistance. It's yeah. pushing through that resistance that you hammer this bad idea and a good one or this hunch into working out what it is that you actually think about stuff. The interesting thing with translation is that um, uh, uh, in addition to all those complications, the content itself is also a given. 
you know, so you have another kind of statistical kind of, you know, constraint, you know, on your chances of getting a half decent poem out of this thing. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's another level of negotiation that actually introduces all sort of kind of almost extra literary considerations like what is fidelity? What do you have fidelity to? How much do you really care about the human who initially produced this prompt, yeah. you know, in this content? To what extent are you going to be faithful to that? What is the nature of faith itself? Yeah, I, I used the word fealty when I was right. doing it. Yeah, same thing. I mean, I agree that that is a... A, a problem, and, and it's to do with kind of you know interpretation against you know something being traduced. Um, I'm not quite, sh quite sure what traduced would mean. I mean, to me, it means ending up with a bad poem in English. <laughs> um, but uh, but I agree that that that, that the fact that, that that you're not going from a standing star mm. is 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 part of the deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think about when I became interested in poetry and translation um, was in the 60s when I was a teenager and the Penguin Modern Poets series imprint was emerging and a lot of very interesting work was produced. I mean, some of it was very dull to read, to be honest. You know, it was, it was like a report about a poem where the poem had taken place elsewhere. And occasionally, you would come across somebody whose work just seemed to cross over into English, and that was very exciting. I mean, I think one great example of that is the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, um, who's been translated by more than one person. But, I mean, just to give an example, and I, ideally, you know, I would write this on a... I'd have a slide to show you to compare it, but I'll, I'll just rely on your obvious powers of listening. There's a poem called To the Hungarians, which he wrote after the Russian invasion of Hungary in 1956. And there are two versions of it. There's one by Alyssa Vales from the 2006, I think, collected poems. And one stanza says, we stand on a border that is called reason and we gaze into a fire and marvel at death. Which is fairly punchy, I think you'd admit. The second and earlier version is by John and Bogdan Carpenter. We stand at the border called reason and we look into the fire and admire death. Now it seems to me self-evident that the second version I've read is the superior one. I'll read them again. We stand on a border that is called reason and we gaze into a fire and marvel at death. That's fine. But the second one is the one that excites me. We stand at the border called reason and we look into the fire and admire death. Now the second seems to me much more of a translation in the sense that interests me, that it sets the poem into operation in English. You know, that establishes relations of irony between the poem's propositions, which are merely described in the first version. You know, so the second version is the one that seems to me to be the properly dramatised poem. And I suppose I'm thinking about translation as a form of dramatisation. You know, I don't want you to report it to me. I want you to give me the experience. You know, I alone escaped to tell you this. I want you to tell me, I want you to show me, insofar as you can, what was taking place in the poem, mm. according to your imagination and your sentiments. I think, nonetheless, that raises the problem about certain poets who are far, not easier, but amenable to translation than others. Um, uh, I mean, Herbert, I think, translates interestingly. You know, I think R Rilke translates interestingly, but that's partly because, you know, what you can derive, even though we know everything is lost and all the nuance and the idiom is gone in any translation, um, you know, and, uh, uh, and the an analogues that you find in, in the target language are necessarily inadequate. Nonetheless, you get a half-decent kind of potato print of the original, you know, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you're dealing with someone like Rilke who works in image and who works in argument. These are things you can successfully abstract and find a, a, a equivalents for. As far, you know, and, and Herbert is the same in that regard, you know, and, and can be honoured in that way. There are certain poets, I think, who, who can't be. Certainly, it's easy to think of poets working in English, 
who would be absolutely whose whose uh, whose uh, uh, successful poetic effects are dependent on the convergence of so many uh, sort of uh, uh, language-specific factors. You couldn't mm. possibly find a equivalent in mm. another one, and therefore we have to assume is that uh, you know is the case w w uh, uh, with other poets. I mean, Paul Celan is a kind of obvious example to pull out the hat as someone who appears to be translator uh, untranslatable because his effects are so kind of locked in the German. And certainly, I was having a conversation earlier and, and you, um, uh, with Robert Verlaine, where we agreed that the only decent translations of, of, of Ceylon, who's held up as one of these people working at the sophisticated limits of a language, are those which translate one word, then another word, then another word, then another word. In other words, you know, they, they, they don't uh, 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 operate at the level of uh, phrasal or, or, or clausal complexity. Um, but paradoxically, you have to translate one word at a time to get any impression, any shadow at all of the original. And I think that says something about the, about the problem. Um, if the poet writes in a way that's dependent on idiomatic effect, you're screwed because it will not translate and, and be all due to a greater or lesser degree. No, yeah. I entirely see that, but what I would add to that is that if poets writing in English, for example, are interested in translating work from other languages and often from languages of which they may have no direct knowledge at all, there is no point in trying to establish an orthodoxy of response in the way that translation theory might try and set out various respectable steps by which academic translations try to be faithful to the original. That's presumably because, you know, sort of under those circumstances, the, the translation itself is an act of individual interpretation. Yes. And, that's, and, you know, and that points to the original yes. as being a fundamentally unstable text, yeah. Yeah. capable of sustaining those different interpretations. Well, in a sense, it's virtuous that it's an unstable text. But, uh, and, yeah, and, uh, absolutely. <coughs> um, and, and uh, you know, si si I mean, if you talk about Salan, I mean, the, the, the word for word business, I mean, <coughs> Th th this thing after this thing after this thing after this thing has to do with a way of sort of decoding image cluster in a kind of way, or well, not decoding, representing. Mm. But 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 also if you if you look at um, uh, at English poets that you think you know w would not translate into kind of whichever language it is you're thinking of, I mean Geoffrey Hill. Talk about Geoffrey Hill for example. You know, sure, so, I'm I mean, doing, you know. You know how would you then then the, sa it, it, the same it's the same applies in in exactly the same way. I mean, you know, you know, Robert Frost famously made that remark about what is lost in the tra you know what, what definition of poetry is what's lost in the translation, you know. But but what is lost in the translation basically is what is definably untranslatable. You know. So so you know those those strictures apply, you know, universally, um, and and the colour and the gradation and the sort of avoir du par of language and and. You know the whole business of, of nuance and just the weight of language, hint, you know, inflection and so on and so forth. None of that, none of that can be can can, can come through really. So, but doesn't so, that make so, you despair? You know, no, when you think you about know, you know your best poem, you know, I, you well, know the one I mean, your best <laughs> poem, when you know, know sort of, you know, and 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 the kind of uh, the delicacy, you know, the circumstances in which it best affects the pen. It it does it makes me despair in one sense, uh, uh, but not in another, which is that. My, my feeling is that what, you're, what, what you need to do, what one needs to do, or what needs to be done, is that an equivalent for that has to be found, or a compensation for that has to be found. So in other words, what you're doing, what one's doing in versioning a poem, which is why I think versioning is the issue, um, is compensating for that loss. Mm -hmm. And you can only compensate for that loss by, to some degree, involving the poem you're versioning in a system of original composition. Mm -hmm. So just as, I said a minute, minute ago, you know, just as in original composition one thing leads to another and you don't turn from an offered phrase or you don't turn from, from a moment when if, you, if it was your poem, if it was an original composition, you would say, yes, that, that absolutely falls to the page. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You don't turn from that because it's not in the original poem. You you welcome it because it works for the poem you're finding in English. Yeah. So, yeah, so that. Well, that's that sorted. <laughs> <laughs> so, any translators in the audience? I don't know. If, I don't know if Frost. <laughs>
who was alluded to a moment ago. I don't know if Frost did any translation himself. Uh, I don't know of any. No, it was a definition of poetry. No, 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 but I'm interested in the idea, you know, actually poetry is what's added in the translation too, you know. The, do you think some people gain a translation? Yes, I think you're not, you can't, from our point of view, you know, being not being particularly linguists, but being poets with an interest in poetry from other languages, especially, you know, major poets like Rilke and um, Ritzos and so on, you're trying to serve them in the only way you're able, you know, which is to make your own account of them. But does that make that service, a, a, really, when you interrogate it, a kind of sentimentality in that case? If you're prepared to take such liberties... It depends how good you are. Right. <laughs> 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 OK. I would have well, what, 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 what do you mean when you say a kind of sentimentality? I mean, just... just well, the idea, when you know, sort of, of a fidelity or a fealty, as you, as you say, I mean, what is that to, exactly? You know, is it to a reputation? Is it to a vision? You know, is it to uh, is it to some uh, 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 some absolute source of inspiration? No, it's got, it's got to be to, it's got you know? to be to a vision. Yeah. yeah, but these things are utterly subjective, and verifiable. The alleged well, the, the, the alleged impermeability. Is it, is it how, sorry, the alleged impermeability of of <coughs> languages <coughs> is Excuse quite me. is quite a modern conception. You know, the Renaissance is full of translations made quite freely by people who adapt, alter, you know, make use of. What, what they find interesting. Yeah, know. but the current position They're not say so that concerned they're like, with originality. No. You know? well, that they're was not full, concerned that was with touching the hem of the robe. They think, here's something, you know, here's something we can use. You know? that, that was and a form of perfectly live. legitimate purloining, wasn't it? No. I mean, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that utilitarian thing is a much more healthy approach than the current one, which is, you yeah. know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's paralysed by self-consciousness. Like that guy who's repeatedly been done for plagiarism recently, you know, sort of, you know, he's found something he can use, you know, so he's used it. You know? So we should applaud him. <laughs> yeah. Possibly how not. come? Here's a very moral point. How come that's that's absolutely appalling, you know, when it's within one language, but yet in a translingual way, that's to be applauded. That kind of plagiarism. Why is that? Oh, why is that cool in translation, but uncool when it's a when it's? Well, for one thing, it's hard work. What is <laughs> translation? All right. Covering your tracks I mean, anybody, is hard, you know? that, that remark of Eliot's about amateurs borrow and prose steal, you mm. know, that was one of the... It's like a hostage to fortune for all kinds of people ever since, you know. It's a, a justification for rapping, sampling, mashups, all kinds of, you know, well, What's that rubric problems. about um, to do it once is theft, to do it twice is research? Who, who was that? <laughs> I, <can't remember. laughs> I wonder what it's three Steal once is theft, to steal twice is research. Quite like that. I've done quite a lot of research in my time. <laughs> yeah. That's probably Lord Lucan who said that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it probably was. Have we, um, have we set our say, do you think, gentlemen? Have we really exhausted the subject, so soon? Uh, well, no, we've merely broached it. Right. Sidelong. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, this whole day has been about the business of translation and, and, and uh, you know, the, the, um, the notion was, you know, is it is it is it possible? What was the what was the uh, the impossible art or something of that kind? Yeah, oh, it's up there. It's up there. Is it? Yes. <laughs> how, how come I latched onto that so fast? Uh, um, um, and and you know, it's both possible and not possible. It, it's impossible in, in in the sense that we all absolutely understand. Um, you know that it's it's. Uh, you know, it's impossible to produce the same effects um, and, you know, the same uh, linguistic effects and so on and so forth. can't be done. But at the same time, it's not impossible because, you know, there are other ways of, of producing that poem um, more or less satisfactorily, I think, by versioning and so on and so forth. I'm intrigued by what compels us to do it in the first place, and, you know, and it's kind of, you know, when you get behind it and you think, why did we keep doing this? It's presumably about sort of, uh, you know, introducing some 
uh, alien DNA into the gene pool, and that's how we keep the language refreshed, is by this, this compulsion to introduce that which it, it doesn't already sustain. And, um, yeah. and we do so at the kind of micro level with our own practice. You know, when we get sick of our own voices, it's always been the case that we, 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 we've looked to versioning, looked to translation. Well, your Machado was, was just that. I'm well, I mean, it's just like, well, it's, well, so it's, you know, presumably Wyatt and Petrarch, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a way of, uh, of shucking off your own voice, you know, uh, yeah. you know, and reminding yourself that your own voice is nothing more than a rhetorical construct. Well, Patrick um, McGinnis is... And the language does the same thing. Sorry? <laughs> Your own voice is nothing more than a rhetorical construct. Well, I'm speaking about my voice, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> yours is a magnificent thing. That's it. Supple, <laughs> capacious, versatile. But I, I one thing one could add is that <coughs> you know, those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first might want to translate things. <laughs> I mean, the recent um, fairly well-received version of the entire Commedia by Clive James prompts all kinds of interesting questions about translation in that, you know, Clive decides to do it in quatrains, which is something I remember Don proposing as being a good idea quite a few years ago, uh, alleging that the quatrain was actually the tercet for English. But you've probably forgotten that now. But I've forgotten that, but I can see there was, there's an argument to be made that it, yeah, goes, yeah. it doesn't go against the grain no, of no, English no, sentence. No, no, I quite That's understand all. it. There was, uh, and the translation itself has some amazingly effective passages, mm. but like all translations, it's also, you know, there are bits where it's just not happening. But the, those, the gods we should destroy, they first make mad or they make translate things. They also make, make them make comments about things. So there was some character who some guy called Dennis Looney, who's apparently a famous Dante scholar. It's a scholar, famous Dante scholar, yeah. Famous Dante scholar who said, when you read this, you wonder why Dante didn't explain things more clearly. And I'm thinking, <laughs> we really have gone past, you know, we've gone past the bar. You know. <coughs> but it's if the Dante Australian Dante. wants to do that, I assume he would have done so. You know, <laughs> But I mean, Clive was some, I mean, just to leap to Clive's defense immediately, Clive would have justified that by saying that we've become so detached from the cultural circumstances of the medieval Italian that, you know, sort of there are, there are different ways of approaching the problem of annotation. You but can do it through footnotes. That's not what Looney was saying. Uh, well, yeah, but Looney's neither here nor there. It's the text, surely. And that's the reason for the quatrain, is so we can have that Australian no, it's assumptions. Scroll it's assumptions line. about the integrity of the original language. Right. I agree, that's Which absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're it's the fact that, that um, Patrick McGinnis... I mean, it's like translating uh, Jane Austen. You know, at the moment, Jane Austen is being translated into <clears throat> an Argo Erotica. saga. You know. Into what? Well, they're, they're, <laughs> they've acquired a kind of famous middle brown novelist who's been asked to you know, do a new version of a Jane Austen novel in order that people can understand it. I mean, that seems that's not the same as translation, but it be? is a source of translation. But you don't think that, you know, when these great texts, you know, so one of the advantages of a translation is that they, they can be updated into the culture of the age in a way that makes them understandable again, it makes them comprehensible again. That's extreme, In a yes. way that doesn't require the mediation of scholarship. That's extreme, yes, it's, it's, it is a bit like writing plays set in remote historical periods where you have to find a language which is not all forsooth but it doesn't sound like something everybody's saying. It's a more complex issue than that. What, I I'm mean, sure even I'm Elizabethan English, I mean, look at you lose all the punning, you lose all the idiom, you lose all the intertextuality, you're just detached from the, the culture. Are you, you talking about translation here? Or about, right, yeah. I just I come back to this business of, um, of uh, why we do it. Um, and uh, Financial inducements have a part, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Could be that, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it, 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 Patrick McGuinness's um, piece earlier, talk earlier, uh, had had to do with um, uh, translations that weren't actually translations; they were fakes. That is to say, they purported to be translations of uh, uh, certain poets, but in fact, the people who had written the pieces. <coughs> weren't translating at all, they were producing original work and uh, so on. Um, and uh, one of the things that occurred to me while he was talking was that with, with translation and, and the business of why we do it, um, you know, it has to do on a personal level, uh, to some degree I think, with a sort of release into style, an mm -hmm. escape into style, so that 
you know, just as Don famously once said, or infamously once said, or said, uh, um, there's no memory of <laughs> that your Machado versions, because you were tired of writing Don Pass on poems, or worse, that effect, needed a break, perhaps, from writing them. By the same token, you know, there is this business of, of stepping outside what one normally does, stepping outside what one is, um, as it were, given to do uh, uh, as a poet, and, 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 and tackling a sort of different issue um, in a different way, and in a different way because it is a different issue. So, for example, when I wrote my versions of Goran Simic's poems, which were written under siege in Sarajevo, uh, there were particular reasons for my doing that, and, and, and in part it had to do with the fact that Goran Simic was a friend of mine, <coughs> and uh, secondly that I'd been sort of caught up in the Bosnian war in a sort of way, not that I fired guns at anybody. Sadly, although I met Radovan Karadzic on one occasion, I didn't fire a gun at him. really wish I had. Good boy, though. Huh? Nah, I'm joking. What? He's not a good boy, I'm joking. He's not a good boy. <laughs> well, he actually, I, I met... This is en passant, but I met Karadzic when I was reading at the Writers' Union in Sarajevo. And I didn't know who he was. Why would I? He was a shrink. He was a local shrink. Um, and he was the shrink of a friend of mine um, who was a drunk. And uh, Karadzic's method for treating his patients who were drunks was to open a bottle of whiskey. Uh, anyway, um, he came up to me and said, I too am a poet. Uh, I liked your work anyway. I didn't shoot him at the time. Um, but, being, but that involvement, in a sort of way, my, my reason for doing those versions initially was that I was trying to raise the profile of Goran Simic and thereby raise the profile of the Simic family and try and get them out of Sarajevo. I was trying to get, them a, trying to get Goran a, a sinecure at UEA, uh, which they would have given him had he been allowed to come out. But then... Uh, the business of uh, the sort of intense business of um, of uh, need uh, and so on and so forth uh, was overtaken by uh, serious interest in what I was doing in, in in remaking or making versions of those poems, um, and I did find with that as as with Ritzos, who are the only two poets I've really concentrated on in, in versioning, although I've done other one or two other cover fee and and so forth, um, was that I was actually stepping outside my normal, my, not comfort zone, but my normal zone uh, of, you know, my own sensibility in a kind of way, and, and inhabiting, co-inhabiting, co I suppose, in a kind of way, um, uh, another sensibility and um, a different kind of compositional uh, carry on and so on and so forth and, and, and it was intriguing and interesting to do that and it was to some degree a holiday it was a relief it was um, <coughs> you know Lowell when Lowell wrote his um, when he wrote imitations and did other translations and so forth he, he did it when he wasn't able he wasn't he didn't find himself able to write poetry of his own um, and I think there's you know there's something in that there certainly is for me uh, do you find that yeah, entirely. That's what I start, I start doing. I'm absolutely blocked, but usually blocked is, turns out to be the same as sick of oneself, you know, or, yeah. or the or the or the, the, the patterns of one's own. So, is there, is, there a, is there a release into that that frees you up in other ways? I mean, I find that if I've been doing that, if I've, you know, so, I, mean, I mean, I've written versions of things that I'll never probably publish because, you know, they're not. It's, it's not a, a concerted effort. It's it's um, you know just this and that. Uh, Foshnesensky, for example, I did a couple of, you know, just because just things intrigue me. That poem, Yago Ya, for example, which I've got. And, and it just, it just it's, it's still poetry, but it's not the kind of pressure that original composition puts you on. No, and I think uh, the whole thing about original pressure, it's just like, uh, you know, for me, the whole blog thing is, is it often feels like an absolute failure of the will, you know, or a failure of courage at some level, you know, and it's just the whole thing's become kind of pointless and self-impersonating and involuted. Um, and I do find that, you know, when you make a translation, often you can arrogate to yourself a certain rhetorical bravery that you don't find yes, within yourself that, anymore. Uh, yeah, I totally you understand. Know, and then when you come back to your own work, you certainly have the courage to say those things because, yeah. they're, they're, you know, there's a tradition of saying them elsewhere or you're, or you're uh, standing on somebody else's... Also, do you find that there, there are little freedoms that you've been released into, little linguistic freedoms, yeah. 
that you've been released into. Totally. You know, little sort of, I mean, there are one or two times when, when you know, I, I've been working on Resource, for example, which my most recently, and Resource I really felt connected to. I really felt deeply emotionally connected to Resource and so on and so forth. And I found that um, there were little, um, when I came to do my own work after that, as it were, little holiday or something like that, there were little, there were sort of image clusters and so on and so mm. forth that I would never have thought of, or, or that I would have thought of in a different kind of way, or I wouldn't have made use of in quite the same way. No, um, exactly. Or wouldn't have led to things, to, to other things in quite the same way. That's, yeah, I, I think the same thing, yeah. Source, you know, yeah. I think the I same th thing with Rilke, you know, in a yeah. way that was just like, you know, because uh, so there are certain heights that you try to sort of, uh, uh, you know, clamp at awards in English that strike is just simply pretentious. Yeah. But, but yeah. you know, but, but watching Rilke are merely a kind of vatic sort of, uh, 